Genesis chapter 24, we're going to pick up in verse 1. Uh, we spoke last time more of a theological and doctrinal perspective, almost a seminary lecture, lecture perspective on Genesis 24. Today we are going to dive in verse by verse using our SOAP method. Starting in verse 1 of Genesis 24, the Word of God says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years. Wow, how many times have we heard this statement about this man? God mightily used him during old age. He was, what, around 75, I believe it was, when he left uh, Haran in obedience to the Lord's call. And then he had Isaac at an old age and all these things. So Abraham is an old dude, but uh, I, I think definitely there's an application here, brothers and sisters. You may be old in years, but guess what? The Lord can still use you. You're never too old to be used by the Lord. As long as you're on this, this earth, he can use you mightily for his glory and Christ's exaltation. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who was in charge of all he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but I will go, excuse me, but will go to my country, to my kindred for the sake of to take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. Now I want to make a point right now, so far in this passage. We see very clearly that Abraham knows his son does not need a heathen wife from the Canaanites. He needs a son from amongst Abraham's own family. And, and family lines and, and kindred and kin and tribes were very important. Marriages within your own people it was a very important point at this time in history. It, it seems to have uh, kind of lessened in its importance in the modern world. We do not emphasize as much marrying within your ethnicity or within your people group as much. Now that and that is not necessarily the case in all places, but uh, interracial marriage and inter is not as big of a deal, at least in most modern uh, cultures today. Now there are still certainly tribes and, and more third world nations where marrying within the family or the distant tribes or whatever your community is very much enforced or, uh, or at least strongly urged. But there are some points definitely made here. Number one, um, Abraham directs the servant to swear to him. This is his oldest servant, and this servant was in charge of all that he had, a very chief and wise and respected servant. He, he is to swear, he is to promise by God's name that uh, he will seek out a wife for Isaac, but to go back to Abraham's own clan, his family, to seek one. And, and the servant makes the statement in verse 5, what if the woman is not willing to come with me? I mean, an honest and legitimate question. I'm going to go seek out a wife. What if she won't come back to me? And Abraham is going to respond to that, you know, and he, he says in verse 6, Abraham does, well, basically, if, if, if she does not come back, do not take my son back there, you know, because the servant's like, well, should I take your son if the lady won't come? No, do not take my son back there, and Abraham's going to say more about that in verse 7 when we pick back up. But I also want to make the point that the woman had free choice here. Marriages, while they, this would be an arranged marriage, Somebody else was seeking out as a uh, emissary, a, a middle party, a third party to seek out a wife for another. This is, in a sense, an arranged marriage, and yet at the same time, the woman has the choice. And I think that's an important point. And in Jewish society, there was betrothal, there was arrangement of many marriages, but at the same time, the woman had the choice, and the man, whether or not they would uh, say the wedding vows. Now, wedding vows are not specifically mentioned in Scripture, but nonetheless there is a ceremony that takes place, and the, both parties have a choice whether or not to willingly enter into that marriage. So while there may have been societal pressures, that certainly could be in familial pressures, uh, there was still individual choice here. Verse 7, The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, who spoke to me and swore to me, Your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife of my son from there. 
But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So we see very clearly Abraham make an explanation. God will send his angel. Abraham certainly is placing his trust in the Lord for the marriage of his son, which is also a very powerful lesson, especially for those who may be unmarried who are reading this passage. Uh, for those who are already married, they will certainly, I believe, see the truth in this, and I'll make comments about that in a moment. But the Lord is the one who goes before us in marriage. If it is the Lord's will for us to marry, and certainly seeking of the Lord's will should be done in marriage. And Paul talks about that a lot over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, if you want to marry and you do marry, you have not sinned. It's not wrong to marry, but you must marry in the Lord. You must marry a believer if you are a believer. If you are an unbeliever, you need to marry an unbeliever. That is the only real restriction uh, that the scripture gives. You must marry in the Lord, marrying another believer. The Bible says, though, that if you want to be single for the sake of Christ, that is certainly fine. But if you burn with passion, and that does specifically refer to if you have strong sexual desire and you need to marry in order, um, in a sense, to fulfill that desire in the way God intended. It is not wrong to have sexual desire. God created humanity as sexual beings. But it is wrong to seek fulfillment of those desires outside of marriage. Sexual desire is meant to be uh, gratified and fulfilled between husband and wife. It is not wrong for two Christians, a man and woman, to enjoy sex in their marriage. That is not a wrong thing. Now, it is, it is wrong, though, for a man or a woman to seek out sexual gratification through fornication or immoral living or pornography. Anything that is an attempt to satisfy or fulfill sexual desires outside of marriage is not mandated or and not condoned biblically. We certainly see that. Nonetheless, God works really divinely in our marriages, and we even could go so far, I believe, as to say God does arrange our marriages. God knows things and has a plan that is foreordained before the foundation of the world. God foreknows all of these things. And uh, many men, you know, when asked, why did you marry your wife? How did you know she was the one? Well, I just knew she was the one. Well, I believe that's a testimony once again to the Lord's will. And certainly I believe many believers, even if they were not directly seeking the Lord's will back when they got married, I believe they can look back and uh, see the Lord's fingerprints. And if you are married now, I also want to make notes because sometimes there's somebody in the crowd that says, well, what if I miss God's will and I married the wrong person? Let me say this very clearly and very strongly. If you are married you are in God's will. If you are married to an unbeliever and you yourself are a believer, you may have even thought, well, I thought they were a believer when we got married, but then they like disowned the faith after several years. Let me say very clearly, you are in God's will to be married. Scripture is very clear that as long as your unbelieving spouse will live with you, then you are to live with them. And the scripture is also very clear. Now, it is specifically speaking to women, but I believe the principle applies to men as well. You are not supposed to nag your spouse to become a Christian. You are to live your life, live for the Lord, live a godly life, but you are not supposed to try to, sh to shove the gospel down your spouse's throat. Live peaceably with your spouse, love them as Christ has called you to, respect them, love them, be their spouse. And as long as you do that and they are willing to live with you, remain married. There is nothing unbiblical. If you are a believer and wonder if you missed God's will because, well, we've kind of had some tension or we've had conflict in our marriage after several years. Well, let me ask you this. What marriage does not have conflict? Because let's just be honest. You take two sinners, they make a covenant between each other before God to marry each other. To become one the rest of their lives, two becoming one is not exactly easy. And two fleshly sinful human beings whose sin gets on each other's nerves is certainly going to cause conflict from time to time. Even two believers are not perfect because the flesh wars against the spirit. 
Now, I am not talking about abuse, and I am not talking about there being biblical grounds for separation within marriage. Certainly, if there is abuse going on or very deep-seated issues and conflicts, separation is not an unbiblical response. But divorce should not be the solution for anything outside of adultery. And even in the case of adultery, there can be the healing, the miraculous and wonderful healing of God if both parties commit to repentance and working through restoration. I do not believe even if adultery has occurred in your marriage, I do not believe that, that divorce should be the immediate response. Certainly counseling, certainly seeking the Lord and seeking forgiveness and restoration should be our first move as believers not our last resort option or not just if it looks like that is an option no sin is too great for god to heal certainly there are those who will sin and then not repent and well divorce may be an option in that case it well i don't want to use the term option it may be the result if there is an unrepentant believer in the case of adultery but certainly the marriage can also be restored by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and healed. So we see those lessons today and those applications I, I wanted to bring out. Now we're going to close here. And next time we will pick back up and uh, we will see Abraham's servant begin to set out. God bless brothers and sisters. And next time we will pick back up. And we will continue to see God's divine work in the arrangement of the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah.